Hi, my name is Jennifer Hachigian, and in this tutorial I will show you how to create a curve in Modeler, how to convert that curve to a virtual spline and layout using the Curve to Spline utility, and how to achieve spline instancing. Towards the end I'll also show you the new Match Perspective option that will let you match your camera to the perspective view in layout. So without further ado, here's the tutorial. Let's create a curve in Modeler. Activate the Points tool right-click in the top view, and lay down a number of points in a spiral shape. Type Control p to create a curve. Save this object as Spline1. Let's create another curve in Modeler. So we'll create a new object, and this time let's build a, a curve from existing points of, a, of an object. So we'll use the Cone tool and have, make sure its axis is aligned with Y, give it eight sides, three segments, leave the rest of the settings at their defaults, hit the spacebar to drop the tool, and hit K to, to kill the points. Then what you can do is you can select the points in a spiral shape, and after we're done selecting these points in a spiral shape, we are going to hit Control p to make a spline from these points. So hit Control p and it draws a spline in the order that you have selected the points. Save this object as Spline2. Now that we've created our two curves in Modeler, let's see what we can do with them in Layout. Load the first of the two curves that we created into Layout, and open up the classic scene editor so that we can take a good look at what's going to happen. Curve type polygons are not directly supported in layout at this time, which is why it appears as a bounding box. You can look at the points that make up this curve, and you can even get a rough approximation of it if you look at the wireframe mode. But when you look at it in texture shade solid wireframe mode, it's not going to appear. To convert this curve into something that we can use in layout for our scene, go to the Setup tab, go to Edit, and run the Curve to Spline script. I'd like to say a few words about what Curve to Spline did to this object. What it did was it analyzed the points of the first curve type polygon that it met in the object, and for each point it created a joint of 0% strength that it belongs to the spline. Then what it did was it looked in the scene to see if anything was referencing spline version 1 as a spline item and it saw that none, no such uh, item existed. So then what it did was it created a null object, called it Spline Version 1 Visibility, and then told it to use Spline Version 1 as its spline control. If this item was not looking at, this, uh, at Spline Version 1 for its spline control, the spline would not appear visible to the user. A hierarchy must be referenced by another item in the scene for the spline to be drawn, because it's a motion controller, not a actual spline. So now that we have a virtual spline in our scene, what do we do with it? Well, you could use this hierarchy to animate the camera. So I'd like to do that right now by taking the camera, making spline version 1 its spline item, and then going to its graph editor and animating its Z position from 0 on frame 0 to 1 meter on frame 60, and let's look at what that does. It doesn't go as far as I'd like, so what I'll do is I'll go to the graph editor, set the post behavior to linear so that it just keeps on going, And what Spline Control does is it remaps the camera's Z position animation to distance traveled along this virtual curve, this virtual spline, which is defined by the child objects of Spline version 1. I'd also like to show how Curve to Spline can be used to update an existing spline in the scene. To do that, I'm just going to make a few changes. First, I'm going to clear out Spline 1 visibility because the camera is already referencing this curve, and as long as one item in the scene references this hierarchy as its spline item, the curve will remain visible. 
Next, I'm going to change the colors of this to red, just so that you can see what happens when I run this script a second time, because I've left my default phone color to blue. So with that in mind, I'm going to go to Items, Replace, With Object, and choose the second spline that we had built in Modeler, the second curve type polygon that we would built in Modeler. So now it's spline version 2. But it still has the same children that it did before, so it has the same curve that it did before, even though this curve is definitely taking up a different kind of volume. It actually looks more like a Christmas tree than it does this item. And you can see that by going to vertices to notice that the points of this object are different than the previous one that we had. So, go to the Setup tab and run Curve to Spline again. And it will ask, do you want to update the existing nodes on the selected object? And hit OK. And what it did was it updated the positions of the existing nodes on the object but this second object had more points than the first object did, so it had to add additional nodes. It added these joints, these child objects, to fill in the rest of the spline. Oops. And the camera's animation still works. Now you'll notice that my camera jumped back when I loaded the second object into the scene. This was my fault because before I loaded the second object in the scene, I did not formally keyframe the camera at frame 0. You have to lay a key at frame 0 to tell the camera to stay at frame 0 because when you first launch Layout for the very first time, Layout will always back up the camera every time you load in an object, and the bigger the object, the more it will back up the camera to try to get the entire object in view, and it's doing that with the intention of speed. It wants you to get your scene set up as fast as possible. Well, in this case, I, I didn't want it to back up, so what I should have done was I should have made a key at frame 0 on the z-axis, and then gone to the graph editor and then formally set it to a value of 0 at frame 0. And that way, I can replace this with an increasingly bigger object, and it would not have affected the camera's position at frame 0 at all. So I'm going to show you a couple of times. I'm going to replace this object again. Replace with object. So I've replaced it with the original spline. I'm going to run curve to spline again. And you'll notice it updates the children to match the point positions of the original curve object. Now I'm going to and the camera keeps its animation. I'm going to replace this again with the other spline, run Curve to Spline again, and again the camera maintains its animation cut because this time I had remembered to hit enter twice on frame 0, whereas before when I was setting up the scene I did not do that, which is why the camera reverted to its behavior of automatically backing up whenever a larger object is brought into the scene. So important safety tip. One more note about Curve to Spline. If it sees that another item in the scene is referencing the item that you're converting into a spline as its spline item, if it sees that anything else in the scene has this item as a spline control item, it will not create the visibility null. So if I were to run the script again, first let me take the camera off of this and then run it, the script again, it will create the visibility null because it will see that nothing in the scene is referencing as a spline something in the scene has to reference this item as a spline in order for the virtual spline to be drawn through its nodes. So now that you know the basics of Curve to Spline, I'd like you to clear the scene so that we can do something a little more complicated. From the LightWave 11.6 example content, load Modeler Spline A, which you will find under Objects, Spline Control, Learning. With this object selected, go to the Setup tab, and then run the Curve to Spline script. Now you'll notice that there's a lot more child joints here than there were in the previous splines. So to get them out of our way, 
select all bones of current object because we still have this selected, and hide selected items. They'll still appear when you select them one by one, but they won't appear when you do not have them selected. And then collapse Modeler Spline A in the scene editor so you don't have to look at it. From the same directory that you got Modeler Spline A, load chainlink.lwo. Zoom in so that we can get a better look at this. And select Modeler Spline A. Let's also adjust our OpenGL settings so that we can get a better look at this curve. Type D to bring up the display options, but then go to the GL tab. Right now, a dotted line is being drawn between every single one of these child objects and the center of Modeler Spline A. You can turn that off these dotted lines by turning off Show Spline Targets, so we have a clear look at this spline. And then you can also choose here whether or not you want to see the spline drawn at all, whether you want it to be a curve when it's selected, a ribbon when it's selected, a curve at all times, a ribbon at all times, or a ribbon when it's selected, and a curve when it's not selected. For the purposes of this tutorial, I'm going to leave it at curve for now, but just keep in mind that if you want to change it at any time, you can change it in the GL tab of the Preferences panel. What I would like to do now is take this chain link object and instance it along the length of the spline object. This is a different technique than spline control, even though it uses data provided by spline control. So that's why we need to leave this visibility null in the scene, because it's the only item in the scene that is referencing Modeler Spline A as a spline control. If nothing references Modeler Spline A and its hierarchy as a spline, spline instinct is not going to work. To instance chain link along the length of Modeler Spline A, select Modeler Spline A, type P to go to its properties, go to the Instancer tab, and add instance generator. Then add chain link as the item that you wish to have instance along the length of this virtual spline. Change the type to spline, change the number of instances to 2000, and right now all 2000 instances are stacked on top of each other. So if you want to see spacing between them, you can control that literally by spelling it out with separation, which is a value in meters. So if you want to put a, a one centimeter space between them, you would type in 0.01. If you want to space them in such a way that they cover the entire length of the spline, that the 2000 instances are evenly distributed along the spline, turn on the distribute button. It'll be the same number of instances, but now they're spaced just a little bit farther apart so that they cover the entire length of the spline created by this hierarchy. So to repeat, if you have distribute off, this will be the exact spacing between instances. If you have distribute on, you're asking them to be auto-spaced along the length of the spline. So we've covered the number of instances, we've covered the separation between those instances. I'd also like to talk about offset which defaults to zero, and that's the distance placed between the first instance and the head of the spline. So if you set offset to one, the first instance will be placed a one meter length from the head of the spline. The head of the spline is actually down here, and we've just moved these one meter along the length of the spline. If I were to set the offset to two meters, the first instance will start two meters along the length of the spline. But by default, it will start right at the start of the spline because the offset defaults to zero. We can also envelope this offset value. We can do that now by going to the E button, creating a key at frame 24, and giving it a value of 0.1. Set the post behavior to linear so that it keeps increasing over time. And you can see that the instances are moving their way down the spline because their offset is animated. Now you notice that given enough time or given enough speed, I'm going to increase the value to exaggerate it, you'll notice that the instances are leaving this structure, that once they get to the end of the spline, the instances just keep on going in a mostly straight line. Well, we can force it to loop back over again by changing the spline itself. So you select Modeler Spline A, 
Type M to bring up the Motions Options panel. Go to the Controllers and Limits tab and turn on the Closed Spline checkbox. And if you were to scrub the time slider now, you'll see that it will not leave, that the instances never leave the spline, they just loop right back around again. So if you turn off Closed Spline and leave it as an open loop, the spline, the instances will leave the spline after they reach the end of the spline. But if you turn on Closed Spline, then they'll loop right back around at the start again so that it's just a continuous loop. And having done that, I'm going to reduce the speed so it's not quite as fast. So I'm putting that value of 20, uh, frame 24 back to one-tenth of a meter. So those are the basics of spline instancing. You choose the number of instances, you choose the distribution, and you choose the offset. So what else can we do with this? The first thing we might do is change the display mode from bounding box to shaded solid. Another thing we might do is increase the overall size of these instances. We can do it on a random basis, or in this case we'll do all of them at once by setting the mode to uniform and then setting the scale to 400%. A subtler thing we can do is introduce a sense of imperfection. Right now each instance is perfectly aligned with the next instance because it's mathematically distributed along the spline in that way. We can go to the rotation tab and give it a little bit of randomness. Maybe start out with negative two degrees for the minimum and then two degrees for the maximum just to make it look a little less perfect. A third thing that we might do is add displacement to the offset in the form of a turbulence texture. Instead of defining a minimum and maximum range which are applied at random to each of the instances, I'm going to change this to uniform mode so that all of the instances will be affected in the exact same way by the exact same texture. So I'm going to click the T button and apply a procedural texture, which is going to displace it on the Y axis. Now 0.8 of a meter is a bit much. This ball itself is about one meter in size, so I'll tell it to only displace a tenth of a meter and it's going to displace the position of the instances. And if I leave it to its own devices, the instances will snake their way around this texture. But I think it'd be more fun if we were to animate this texture. So I'm going to go to the Y channel and at frame 24 set it to a value of 0.1 meters. Set the post behavior to linear so that it just keeps on going. And now I've got an animated turbulence texture. So it just looks a little bit cooler. So after showing that, I'd like to show you one more thing. Kind of like the camera angle I have going on here in the perspective view. Unfortunately, it is the perspective view. You can't render from it. The camera is still looking from this position. Fortunately, Lightwave 11.6 has a really nice feature in it. Select the camera that you want to change. There's only one camera in the scene, so it's easy to select that one. Then go to Match Perspective, and you can either create a brand new camera, or you can override the position of the selected camera. And when you do that, you'll notice that a grid pattern has appeared, because the camera has just moved into the place where my perspective view was. So if I were to look through that camera's eyes now, it would match roughly what I had in the perspective view. So now I've got a good starting place from which to render this image. Thank you for watching this tutorial, and I hope this introduces you to some of the new features in 11.6.